Hello, 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 everybody, and welcome to my Zendikar Rising Draft Guide. Before I dive in, I do want to remind you that if you enjoy the video, be sure to hit that thumbs up button and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any of my future Zendikar Rising videos. If you have any questions or thoughts about the guide, be sure to leave a comment and I'll be glad to respond. Without further ado though, let's get to the guide. In this draft guide, I will be discussing the set mechanics, the top three commons for each color, I will give an overview of each two color archetype, I will cover combat tricks you need to play around, trap cards you should avoid, good combos to be aware of, and more. Starting things off with the set mechanics, there are four main mechanics in the set, two new and two returning. The two new mechanics are modal double-faced cards and party. The two returning mechanics are landfall and kicker. We will be looking at the new mechanics first. Modal double-faced cards, henceforth known as MDFCs, may have a long name, but they play out in a fairly straightforward manner. Manner. On the front side of the card is a spell, except for the rare dual lands that have lands on both sides. And on the back is a land that enters the battlefield tapped, with the exception of a cycle of mythics and the aforementioned rares. These cards are all very good for limited, because they help you avoid games where you would either be mana flooded or mana screwed. The spell effect on an MDFC is usually overpriced, but the flexibility of having a land when you need one and a spell when you don't is inherently very powerful. If you get a couple of these, you can treat them as lands in your deck and even increase your land count. For example, if I had three copies of Akum Warrior, I would be more likely to want 18 lands in my deck, 15 basic lands, and the three Akum Warriors. This means I am less likely to get mana screwed, but if I do draw a bunch of lands, I have bonus spells to cast. The other new mechanic in Zendikar Rising is Party. Party captures the spirit of going on an adventure with a D&D &D party by rewarding you for having a combination of clerics, rogues, warriors, and wizards. Each creature can only count for one unique party member type, and having multiples of the same type does not provide additional benefit for party. For example, a party with two rogues and a cleric will give me a party count of two, even though I have an extra rogue. Some cards in the set are allowed to count as more than one creature type for the sake of party. However, these wild cards still only count as one member of a party, so if I have one copy of a card that can be any type, my party size is one. However, if I have one rogue, one wizard, and one wild card, my party size is three. Basically, you cannot double count your members. Party can pay you off in a variety of ways. For example, Kabira Outrider will give target creature plus one plus one until end of turn for each creature in your party. It is important to note that party cards will count themselves, so the worst you are getting with Kabira Outrider is plus one plus one because it is itself a warrior. That's a lot of power if you can get an adventuring crew together. Now, on to some returning mechanics, starting with Landfall. Landfall rewards you for having lands enter the battlefield, often with a stats boost. Landfall often makes it easier to attack than block, because with cards like Canopy Bayloth, the creature will only get the stats buff on your turn when you have made the land drop. It also in Landfall also incentivizes you to find ways to play multiple lands in one turn, or find ways to play lands consistently over the course of the game. For example, Kazandu's Stomper bounces two of your lands back to your hand when it enters the battlefield, which may seem like a downside, but with the Landfall mechanic, it can be exactly what you need to consistently get those triggers. It is also optional in case you need to cast back-to-back -back Stompers or something of that nature. The final returning mechanic is Kicker. This mechanic lets you pay an additional Kicker cost when casting a spell to give you some extra benefit. For example, Cunning Geyser Mage on it, its face is a 3 mana 3 2, but in the late game when you have extra mana lying around, you can pay the extra Kicker cost to get that additional benefit. Kicker is a mechanic that gives you another way to use your lands in the late game, so it is really going to make sure you always have plenty to do. It is especially powerful when Kicker is attached to cards that are good in the early game, because that will ensure that your cheap cards are still relevant in the late game. Moving on to the top commons, we will kick things off with white, and coming in at number one, we have Nahiri's Binding. This flexible removal spell will answer any threat you need answered, and it does answered. It does have the downside of leaving the creature in play for party effects, but it is still a great removal spell for aggressive and controlling decks alike. At number two is Shepherd of Heroes. Shepherd is a big flyer that can stabilize you against an aggressive deck, or it can give you an extra turn to win in a racing situation. 
Usually, five drops suffer from the fact that they have diminishing returns. But Shepherd is better in this respect because the life gain gives you time to cast subsequent Shepherds. It is definitely better in control decks than aggressive ones, but it is a card you are going to be happy with in basically every white deck. Remember that the lowest life it will gain you is two because it is itself a cleric. The number three white common is Farsight Adept. Symmetrical card draw may seem mediocre, but when you are in an aggressive white deck without card draw of your own, you will usually benefit from the extra resource than the grindier decks you face that are already struggling to deploy all their cards. Additionally, Farsight Adept is the only wizard in white, so it will passively make all of your party cards more effective. Next up is blue, and its top common is Into the Royal. This is a very flexible piece of interaction that can not only bounce your opponent's creatures, but also your own when you need to protect them from removal. It is usually best to cast this without the kicker cost, I mean with the kicker cost, but the fact that you can cast it without it is part of what makes the Into the Royal such a powerful card. Coming in at number 2 is Tazim Royal Mage. This is the exact sort of kicker card you want, one that is decent on turn 2, but also good on turn 6 when you kick it. Being a wizard to fuel tribal and party synergies is also a nice bonus. The number 3 blue common is Bubble Snare. This is card is cheap interaction that can deal with creatures already in play, which is something blue tends to struggle with. It also has kicker for the various cards that care about that, and is cheap enough that you can often use it to double spell. There are other blue cards that might have more raw power than Bubble Snare, but Bubble Snare, ha having multiple Bubble Snares in your deck will give you the time to deploy all of your other kicker cards and overwhelm your opponent with card advantage, which means it serves a critical function in your deck. Black's top commons really showcase how much the removal how much removal the color has in this set. At number one is Deadly Alliance, which is a five cost spell on its face, but will often cost four and sometimes even three, which means it is a premium removal spell that you will be happy playing multiples of. It is also fairly easy to splash, so keep that in mind if you find yourself with some fixing and in need of extra removal. And to be frank, who doesn't need extra removal from time to time? The number two black common is Vanquish the Weak. This is an effective answer to most cheap creatures, and it can sometimes even trade up on mana against expensive utility creatures or flyers. At number three is Feed the Swarm, which is definitely powerful, but because it costs a decent amount of life if you want to kill something meaningful, it does get worse in multiples. I would be happy playing one or two, but it can be risky playing more if you do not have any life gain in your deck. It is super powerful though, so it still gets a top three spot. Next up is red, and kicking things off is a kicker spell, Royal Eruption. This is just an efficient removal spell that can even go to the face if necessary. The kicker cost is expensive, so it won't come up much, but when it does, it can give you that little extra boost of damage you need to finish off a key threat, or your opponent. At number two is Grog Bud Bug Catcher. This card may look unassuming, but on face value it is a 2-2 trampler when it attacks, and it only grows from there. Even though it does not block well, it is reasonable to expect this to attack for 3 damage consistently, and the fact that it can attack for 4, or even 5 damage sometimes, is really what pushes it over the edge. You can really never have enough good 2 drops in your aggro decks, and Bug Catcher brings the beat down well enough to be worth the number 2 slot. The number 3 red common is tricky to pin down because there are quite a few cards that get better when you are in a specific archetype, but I've settled on synchronized spellcraft. 4 damage for 5 mana is a bit less than you would expect, but 4 damage is going to be enough to get the job done against most of the creatures you care about killing, especially because green, black, and white all have five, a common 5 drops with 4 toughness, and blue's common 5 drop only has 3 toughness. The extra damage is nothing to scoff at either, as getting an extra points of face damage can really turn the tides of a game. You can't afford to have too many 5 drops, but Spellcraft is strong enough that I'm happy playing a copy or two in any red deck, which is why it is at number 3. Last, but certainly not least, we come to green, a color featuring plenty of solid commons. Coming in at number 1 is Rabbit Bite, which is just about the best removal spell green gets these days, and as such is a high pick. Green can sometimes struggle to interact, but Rabbit Bite is the perfect tool to leverage your bigger creatures and use them for removal. At number 2 is Gnarled Colony, which is a classic kicker card that is good early or late, and the benefit of giving some of your creatures trample is sneaky good as well. Finally, at number 3 is Jiraga Visionary. This is just a 2 for 1 attached to a reasonable body, which is nearly always good. It is also a wizard, which is good for tribal and party synergies, even though green is typically not the wizard color, and will help you churn through your deck to find your big creatures, while also being an effective creature in its own right. 
Ranking colors is tricky, but if you were able to choose what you drafted, this is where they would fall. Blue just has tons of powerful commons and uncommons, as well as good synergies with the other colors. Black has a ton of removal and powerful tribal elements. White has solid creatures, solid interaction, and serves as a nice complement to the other colors. Green has some good fixing to splash other colors, as well as featuring solid cards across the board. But there are not as many incredible standouts, so it comes in fourth. In last place is red, but that is mostly because more of red's cards are situationally good. When you know what sort of red deck you are playing, you will know which subset of red cards you want, and can work towards a cohesive deck. Overall, though, I want to stress that every color is good and playable, so try not to let this ranking bias your picks too much. Now, onwards to the archetypes. Starting off with red-white, we see it has an aggressive warrior's theme. The signpost uncommon, Cargan Warleader, rewards you for having other warriors, and other uncommons that might push you towards red-white are Goma Feta Vanguard, which lets your creatures swing past blockers while also being a solid two-drop, and Paired Tactician, which can quickly grow out of control. Red-White is looking for, above all, a good curve, cheap interaction, combat tricks, and some warrior and party synergies to give your deck some extra power. Next up is Blue-Black, a controlling deck that has high card quality, good removal, and a rogue mill sub-theme. Blue and Black have some of the best tools for winning a long game naturally, but there are also a host of other tools that reward you for milling your opponent to get 8 cards in their graveyard. This not only powers up your cards, but gives you an additional source of inevitability decking your opponent. The signpost uncommon for this color pair is Soaring Thought Thief, and while this rogue might not win you the game on its own, it facilitates your other cards nicely and is a great fit for the color pair. Other uncommons that are great in this deck are Lol Mage's Domination and, and Black Bloom Rogue. While Lol Mage's Domination is already good on its own, it gets even better when combined with the blue-black mill sub-theme. Another fantastic payoff is Black Bloom Rogue, and once it gets to 5 power, it is almost always going to trade two for 2 cards when it gets blocked. Being a MDFC is also going to make sure that you don't get flooded or mana screwed when you have Black Bloom Rogue in your deck. Be on the lookout for good control cards, rogues, and mill, and you are well on your way to success with Blue Black. Next up is Green White, which is often an aggressive landfall deck, but can also use Green's fixing to assemble some pretty nice party synergies. The signpost uncommon is Morassa Root Grazer, which is not only overstatted, but also makes sure you hit a land drop every turn, which is critical for your payoff cards like Fearless Hatchling. Fearless Hatchling is a terrifying threat on turn two, and if you have ways to make land drops consistently, it will only continue to grow. Roiling Regrowth is the exact sort of card that Green White is looking for, because it serves not only a ramping and fixing role, but also a combat trick role, as it lets you put multiple lands into play with one card at instant speed. This will lead to some truly explosive turns, and is a great addition to any landfall strategy. Next in our tour of the archetypes is Blue Red, which is a deck focused around wizards, instants, and sorceries. The signpost uncommon is Umara Mystic, which is a great flying threat that can often hit for 3 or even 5 in a turn. Windrider Wizard is another evasive threat that keeps you churning through your deck looking for more spells, and Rock Slide Sorcerer is great for keeping your opponent's creatures in check while you win with your wizards. And it is even scarier when you can cast multiple instants, sorceries, or wizards in one turn to bing ping down two toughness creatures. Next is Green Black, an archetype built around plus one plus one counters. The signpost uncommon is Moss Pit Skeleton, which has some nice flexibility built in and works quite nicely with other counters payoffs like Skyclave Shadowcat and Iridescent Horn Beetle. Skyclave Shadowcat is a card that not only grows the more you sacrifice creatures, but also keeps you churning through your deck to find more spells when your other synergistic plus one plus one counter creatures die. Another big payoff is Iridescent Horn Beetle, which may be expensive to cast, as it does cost 5, but it can single-handedly take over a game with its insect production, building you an army all on its own. Blue-White is another color combination that makes use of party, while also being a potent control deck that can win with flyers. Its signpost uncommon is Spoils of Adventure, which is a ton of card advantage that also gives you a life buffer to help you cast the cards, which is absolutely fantastic, especially when you cast it for cheap. Another great party payoff is Ameria Captain which can play offense and defense, helping you win the game while keeping your life total high. There are not a ton of great party payoffs in blue, but it still provides high card quality, and the wizards and rogues in blue combine well with the warriors and clerics in white to give you a cohesive party deck. One such wizard is Merfolk Falconer, and while this card is just fantastic in any blue deck, I showed it on this slide in particular to represent the fact that blue is oftentimes just going to be providing creature types, and power level to the more synergistic elements in white of your blue-white decks. 
Next up is Red-Green Landfall Aggro, a classic Zendikar archetype. The signpost uncommon is Brushfire Elemental, which can be a devastating attacker early in the game and combines particularly well with effects that let you play an additional land. Another great landfall creature is Skyclave Geopede, which hits extremely hard and will end the game fast if left unanswered. Skyclave Pickaxe may look unassuming, but it lets all of your creatures get in on the landfall fun. It is deceptively powerful as it turns any of your creatures into a big threat for your opponent. You need your deck to be aggressive to make use of it, but that is a general theme with landfall creatures, as they are much smaller on defense. When drafting, prioritize curve and cheap spells to get out in front of your opponent, and make sure to hold extra lands if you can, in case you draw your landfall creatures later. Another color pair, another tribe, as White Black presents Clerics and Life Gain as its main theme. The signpost uncommon is Cleric of Life's Bond, which is super powerful as both an enabler and payoff all in one, fueling your life gain synergies and growing into a potent threat. Other life gain payoffs include Attended, Attended Healer and Scion of the Swarm. Healer helps you flood the board and can also be a nice facilitator with its activated ability, and Scion is a great way to end the game once you have your engine set up. Blue-Green is a kicker deck this time around, featuring the signpost uncommon Lol Mage's Familiar. Getting the mana to cast your spells kicked can sometimes prove difficult, so the ramp is pretty helpful. Vine Gecko is both a facilitator and a payoff, giving you the mana you need and a growing creature all in one package. Roost of Drakes may be the best kicker payoff of all, as it gives you an additional 2-2 flyer every time you kick something. This can quickly take over a game and is a great reason to move into the archetype. The final two-color archetype is Red-Black, another deck built around Party. The signpost on common is Ravager's Mace, and if you have built your deck correctly, this turns any deck, any creature into a potent threat, and usually other decks will not be interested in it, so you can hopefully get it late. Another powerful payoff for Party is Shatter Skull Minotaur. It hits incredibly hard and comes down earlier in this deck than others, making it a great threat. And Thwart the Grave is another great payoff for Party, making sure that even if your creatures die, they will be back for round two shortly. Make sure you get a decent mix of creatures from all the classes, mostly warriors and wizards in red, and clerics in road in black, rogues in black, and you can get some nice synergy pieces into motion. Moving on to the combat tricks, there are several at common and uncommon to be wary of. In white, there is allied assault, resolute strike, and sejiri shelter. Blue has between the veil and chilling trap. Black has oblivion's hunger and subtle strike. Red has only inordinate rage. Green has Might of Marassa and Vastwood Fortification. It's important to be aware of these tricks so you don't get blown out by them, and knowing what your opponent can have is the first step towards playing around it. There are also a couple of trap cards that look like they might be good, but are actually not worth playing. Concerted Defense is a single blue mana for an effect that can sometimes be very potent. However, the problem is that Negate is also in this set at common, and that card is almost always going to be superior for your deck because it is uh, going to definitely counter the spell instead of being situational. Sizzling Barrage is also a card that is much worse than it looks, because normally this type of effect would deal damage to an attacking or blocking creature. Only hitting blockers means that it's easy for your opponent to play around the card, and if you are on the back foot, it is a complete blank. Moving on to some combos, starting things off with the combo between Expedition Skulker and Zulaport Duelist. The way this combo works is you play your Expedition Skulker, and then either on blocks or when attacking, you flash in your Zulaport Duelist to not only shrink your opponent's creature, but also give your Expedition Skulker Death Touch at instant speed. This sort of combo is going to be really tricky to play around, and while the 1 1 body of the Zulaport Duelist might not be worth much, it can still help fuel your other rogue synergies. Next combo is dread, the combo between Dread Worm and Taunting Arbor Mage. On turn 5, you play your Dread Worm. On turn 6, you play your Taunting Arbor Mage. Uh, you play your 6th land, giving Dread Worm indestructible, and then play your Taunting Arbor Mage, making it so that all of your opponent's creatures have to block the Dread Worm. You then attack with all of your creatures, and your opponent must gang block the Dread Worm, letting you kill several of their creatures, while also pushing a bunch of damage with your other creatures that are going unblocked. This sort of combo is going to end a lot of games, and will also get you a ton of value if, even if you are not striking for lethal. The next combo is a infinite loop between Morassa Sproutling and Blood Beckoning. The way it works is you have your Morassa Sproutling in play, it then dies, and you use Blood Beckoning to return it to your hand along with another creature. When you then replay the Morassa Sproutling, you can kick it to get back Blood Beckoning, and then when your Morassa Sproutling dies, you have the Blood Beckoning at the ready to return it and another creature, thus netting a creature every time in the process and having infinite creatures. It is a slow combo, but it is definitely a great way to ensure inevitability if you are going to be going to the late game. 
The final combo I want to highlight is a combination between Core Celebrant and Marauding Blight Priest. The way that this combo works is when you have a Core Celebrant in play and a Marauding Blight Priest in play, any creature you play will gain you a life and also cause your opponent to lose one life. This common-based life gain combo truly gets ridiculous when you pl have multiples of either piece in play, turning each creature you play into multiple drains of your opponent and killing them much quicker while also keeping your life total high. Moving on to the fixing, uh, it is clear that most of it is centered in green, though there are some surprising additions in the other colors. In the land slot, there you will have access to base camp, though this is generally not great unless you have a ton of uh, party creatures that you're trying to cast or activate, because coming into play tapped is a huge cost, as well as not tapping to cast your other non-party spells. Cleansing Wildfire is usually going to be used to enable your landfall cards, letting you put multiple lands into play uh, in one turn to really power up your creatures, but it can also be used to fix your mana if you are looking to splash. And Lithiform Blight is a cool way to give blacks some fixing, even though black is typically not going to be the base color you're using to splash. Stonework Pack Beast, henceforth known as Party Prismite, is really not a card you can consider as fixing, but if you are looking to splash, it does make you more likely to want the Stonework Pack Beast, and you can sometimes consider it as like a third of a color source or half a colored source. The problem with counting it as a full colored source is that you really don't want to be relying on it to splash your cards, because then you can't get it into combat or trade off with other things. So Stonework Pack Beast is more of second or third tier fixing. Moving on to the green fixing, which is quite good, we already discussed Roiling Regrowth, which is fantastic not only for the landfall reasons we previously discussed, but also for fixing your mana. Reclaim the Wastes is the common green fixing, uh, and this card can not only fix your mana, but also ensure that you have a steady stream of lands to play to fuel your landfall cards. And finally, Vast Wood Surge is another way to get multiple lands into play for one card, and can ramp you up to do some truly powerful things. And if you do ever kick it, you are almost always going to win that game. Some final tips for the format are to put extra thought into your land drops. On one hand, there are landfall creatures that reward you for sandbagging lands, holding them in your hand until you have those landfall payoffs in play. And on the other end, there is also some powerful card draw in the set. And if you do have that card draw, you are going to want to play your lands, because that way, if you do draw your card draw, you can play your card draw, draw into more spells, and proceed to immediately play those spells instead of not being able to play multiple spells in a turn after drawing your card draw. So when you do are building your deck, and when you are playing your games, make sure that you're thinking about what you have in your deck when you are making your lands. Don't just mindlessly play lands or mindlessly hold lands. Make sure that you are thinking, am I the sort of deck that wants to play my lands to uh, facilitate my card draw or hold my lands to facilitate my landfall? I think there will be decks of both sorts, so make sure you know which one you are. The other tip is that this set is highly synergistic, so have a plan while you are drafting. Party is the type of mechanic that requires a lot of work to be good, but it can really pay you off if you are focused in your draft and deck building. And similarly for landfall, if you have a deck that can put lands into play consistently, your landfall deck is going to be much better, and focusing your picks to build a cohesive deck is going to be important. That is going to do it for this draft guide, though. I really do hope you enjoyed it, and thank you so much for watching. Remember to, to help me out by hitting that like button, subscribing to the channel, and commenting if you have any questions or feedback. In the comment section down below, leave hashtag ready for rising to let me know you made it all the way till the end of the video. I really do hope you enjoyed it. I'm super excited to be playing this set, and I hope you are feeling ready to dive into your own drafts now. That is going to do it for this video, though. I hope you enjoyed it, and I will talk to you next time.